It's wonderful to see you all here. Thank you for coming to the 2024 Yale Terry Forum. I'm Debbie Cohen, and I chair the Terry Lectureship Committee. Um, and in addition to hosting the annual Terry Lectures, our committee's mandate is to foster discussion of the relationship between ethics and the sciences. And in that spirit, the Terry Forum addresses questions about ethical knowledge making that cut across the disciplines. This forum is made possible thanks to the support of the Office of the University Secretary, Kimberly Goff Cruz, especially her Chief of Staff, Julia Shea, and Woodbridge Fellow, Yasmin Abed. And I want to express my deep gratitude to all of them. Our question this year is inspired by climate change as a problem that forces us to rethink what it means to be well-educated. How can universities prepare today's students to face the entangled political and ecological challenges that weigh so heavily on this generation? The ideal of a liberal arts education as training for civic life has never been more relevant, but what should the liberal arts for the 21st century look like? Climate change calls on educators to rethink what and how we teach, both in the classroom and beyond it. It calls on us to model respect for the lands on which our institutions sit. Our speakers today are all distinguished scholars with expertise related to the implications of climate change and the philosophy of education. Most importantly, they are passionate and imaginative educators. I'm grateful to them and to all of you in the audience for being willing to think through these questions together today. I've been instructed before we start to remind you that Yale is committed to protecting free expression and peaceful dissent, interfering with the speaker's ability to speak and the audience's ability to hear and see is not consistent with the university's free expression policy. Let me now introduce our moderators. Anna Isabel Kielsen and Justin Reynolds are co-founders and co-executive directors of the Gull Island Institute, a new initiative to reimagine liberal arts education for an era of climate change. Founded in 2022, the Institute runs partnerships with public and private universities, as well as programs in place-based learning through seminar, physical labor, and student self-governance on remote islands in Buzzards Bay, Massachusetts. Anna and Justin founded the Institute after having taught in a range of interdisciplinary and general education programs. An intellectual historian, Dr. Kielsen served from 2017 to 2023 as a lecturer in the Committee on Degrees in Social Studies at Harvard University, where she received multiple teaching awards. She received her PhD in history from Columbia. Prior to her academic career, she danced professionally. Justin Reynolds is a historian of modern religious, environmental, and political thought. He taught for four years in the core curriculum at Columbia, after which he was a lecturer in the Committee on Degrees in Social Studies at Harvard and a visiting professor at Deep Springs College. He received his PhD in modern European history from Columbia, and before entering graduate school, he worked as a scuba diver at the Marine Biological Lab in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. I'll turn it over to you now, Anna and Justin. Is this on now? Okay, great. Um, thank you, Debbie. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. Um, Justin and I are going to introduce uh, our panelists. Um, then we're going to have a discussion and uh, take questions from you all. Um, and yeah, without further ado, um, he ile kavehepu. Kavepu a Akuhao Pulani Hobart, sorry about that, is Assistant Professor of Native and Indigenous Studies at Yale University. Uh, an interdisciplinary scholar, she researches and teaches on issues of settler colonialism, environment, and indigenous sovereignty. Her first book, Cooling the Tropics, Ice, Indigeneity, and Hawaiian Refreshment from Duke University Press, uh, is the recipient of the Native American and Indigenous Studies Association Best F First Book Prize, the Scholars of Color First Book Award from Duke University Press, and it received an honorable mention for the Lara Romeo First Book Prize from the American Studies Association. Uh, Gregory Marks 
is a professor of English at Eugenio Maria de Hostos Community College of the City, of, uh, City University of New York. And his teaching focuses on making humanities topics and texts accessible to the deserving college students of the Bronx. He and a hostess colleague, Dr. Andrea Fabrizio, and other faculty have collaborated on several grants, most recently from the Teagle Foundation, aimed at expanding access to Columbia's core curriculum, seeking to form communities of learners and instructors. Uh, Marx received his PhD from Louisiana State University, uh, and he lives in Queens. J.T. Roan uh, is Assistant Professor of Africana Studies and Geography and Andrew, Mellon, uh, Andrew W. Mellon Chair in Global Racial Justice in the Institute for the Study of Global Racial Justice at Rutgers University. He received his PhD in history from Columbia University, and he's a 2008 graduate of the Carter G. Woodson Institute uh, at the University of Virginia. His book, Dark Agoras, Insurgent Black Social Life and the Politics of Place, was published in 2023 with NYU Press. Roan's short experimental film, Plot, received support from Princeton's Crossroad Fellowship. He currently serves as a member of Just Harvest Tidewater, an indigenous and black-led organization building toward food sovereignty and justice in Virginia's historical plantation region through political and practical education. He is also a 2023-24 visiting scholar in the Charles Warren Center for Studies in American History at Harvard. All right. Well, we have um, we had the snowstorm yesterday, and unfortunately, uh, our fourth panelist, Stephanie Furman, uh, is not able to join because she's um, us in person, but she will be here um, in the screen and in spirit. Uh, the um, she is foundation professor school at uh, at the School of Ocean Futures in the College of Global Futures and senior sustainability scientist at. The, the at the uh, at, at Arizona State University, um, Professor Furman's research focuses on understanding and responding to the changing Arctic, uh, developing innovative approaches to formal and informal education, and exploring the intersection between diversity and interdisciplinarity. She began working on climate change education in 1990, when she led when she co-led the development of an exhibition on climate change jointly produced by the Environmental Defense Fund and the American Museum of Natural History. While on faculty at Barnard College, she co-led the development and teaching of the climate systems class that has been jointly offered by uh, Barnard and Columbia University since 1996. For more than 25 years, her teaching has included facilitating masters and undergraduate capstone and thesis projects exploring global futures, leadership and polar exploration, museum exhibition design and implementation, and innovation in science communication. Um, our final panelist, Brian Garston, um, who uh, has agreed on rather short notice to join um, the forum. Unfortunately, Anthony Grafton is ill and couldn't join us today, but. Brian has, has heroically stepped in in the 11th hour. He's a political, uh, he's a professor of political science and humanities here at Yale. He writes about the history of political thought and its ramifications today. His first book, Saving Persuasion, explored the promise and pitfalls of political rhetoric, and later work has turned to theories of representative government and liberalism. Brian has a longstanding interest in the history and philosophy of liberal education. Um, he helped to found a new liberal arts college, Yale and U.S. College in Singapore, where he oversaw the development of a novel core curriculum that integrated Eastern and Western traditions of thought, and he was lead co-author on a much-cited report, The Purpose of Liberal Arts Education in the 21st Century. At Yale, he's, uh, he chaired the Interdisciplinary Humanities Program and founded the Citizens Thinkers Writers Program, which brings aspiring first-generation college students from the New Haven Public Schools to campus for an intense experience of college seminars and residential life. Uh, that program has helped to launch a, a national Knowledge for Freedom Network, encouraging creation of similar programs linking colleges and their home communities. So we have such a wealth of experience, background, and expertise on this panel, and um, we're going to jump in in a second, but just so you all have some idea of the format, we're going to go um, for about 5.15 with a conversation among uh, the, the, the panelists here, and at that time, we'll open up um, the conversation to questions from the audience. Um, so as we... Um, 
we're thinking about how to start this program. We thought that maybe since, since we're coming from a number of different backgrounds up here, we might start um, by sharing our experiences with liberal arts education. So a first question for everyone on the panel is, is what does an, a liberal arts education mean to you? And what do you understand its aims to be? Leave it open if anyone wants to take the plunge. I'll start. Um, I, so I, I did a liberal arts undergraduate education at Colby College, so I'm, I'm very much a product of um, uh, the liberal arts project. Um, I got a degree in English and creative writing, which is a little far afield from what I do now, but it was really wonderful. Um, and I've really come to understand the liberal arts education as one that teaches someone how to approach a problem or an idea or a place. So this is a practice in learning how to be agile in theory and method. Um, and I really see it as a practice of thinking first about what the questions are that you want to ask of the world and then assembling the methods by which you might answer them instead of moving in the opposite direction. I would really ground my experience with the liberal arts in my undergraduate education at the University of Virginia and particularly at the Carter G. Woodson Institute, um, which was formative in shaping, you know, as I came from a rural, poorly funded high school <laughs> into college, not having a real sense of like what would what is possible, what actually is open territory for learning and all that, and really having the experience in the sense that perhaps you know, the kind of traditional routes of medicine or law or other things might be be it. And in my in twenty um in two thousand and five, my second year as an undergrad at the University of Virginia, Katrina happened. Um and and that really uh, along through a rather kind of more circuitous process and long um sort of politicization process, but um with Really, with experiences, especially with Claudrina Harold, Dr. Claudrina Harold, who um, is a historian at the University of Virginia and at that time was also appointed in the Woodson, um, she held a, a Katrina benefit. I think that was the first time that I saw the ways that um, critical, historical, and spatial and other kinds of knowledges could be put together. Um, with a musical ensemble and with a point. And, and I think that was transformative for me in the long run. Like, how do you, um, how do you get into these kinds of, um, how do you come to a sense of liberal arts education as potentially um, liberatory, given what we know about, um, you know, the histories of, of liberal education in relation to especially black communities, indigenous communities and others. Um, I, I, I've, and I've taken that up, I think, um, through a kind of field experience model with the Black Ecologies Lab that we've been building at the Institute for the Study of Global Racial Justice at Rutgers. Um, my a recent um, Yale graduate from the History Department and, and African American Studies, Tiana Williams, and I have, have been um, leading this. And we started it with these kinds of field experiences because we want people to have a sense of what do all of these things mean with our whole bodies and not just a certain part of our brain in a classroom. What does it mean to gather? Um, and this summer we, we gathered, um, you know, 40 or so black and indigenous folks um, indigenous, including Rappahannock, Mattapanai, and Pamunkey, um, artists, filmmakers, writers, for field experiences first, like grounding us in the place um, of the Tidewater of Virginia, um, and then a public-facing thing that was um, that allowed for micro talks and film showings and all these kinds of things, and I think it was. Um, I think that kind of, again, being able to learn in all those ways what, what climate crisis look, is, but also really what alternatives might feel like, I think is, is a critical aspect of what the liberal arts has been in my trajectory as a liberatory possibility and how I see it going forward. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, I love, <clears throat> excuse me, yeah, I love both of those. Um, Kind of indications of the liberal arts first of all of kind of feeling out those questions first and that first and then seeing where that goes and also of course is liberal arts is kind of liberatory um so and for me uh, i guess my understanding of the liberal arts uh, 
I mean, on the simplest level, would be sort of like, you know, the easiest distinction is to make between the liber liberal arts and those arts, um, which are always defined as for their own sake, versus those sort of transactional educational things of training for some specific job or something like that. Um, and that's fine as far as it goes, as long as we don't have a dismissive understanding of uh, what used to be called the servile arts. Um, so I'm in the Bronx, and so this is where it gets a little bit complicated because um, it's a community college, and so our students come in, um, and they don't come in mostly as liberal arts students as they might in a four-year residential school. Uh, they're interested in rad tech, dental hygiene, and nursing. Uh, that's what they're interested in because of the healthcare fields that will help them become economically enfranchised. And they, these are uh, hardworking um, students with a lot of agency. They're not naive at 18 years old. Uh, they're not naive. Um, and so they very much know what they want. And so my colleagues and I, we are absolutely behind that. Like, yes, absolutely, you do that. Um, but let's briefly step back. And so that's where our Roosevelt Montas and the Columbia University faculty really helped us. Um, we're a little bit, we're just across the Harlem River, sort of, and down the street from uh, Columbia. And so, um, and so they would come over here years ago, and they taught us how to teach these important texts to these students just so they would, you know, think about these deep questions that, and engage in a conversation that they're oftentimes were excluded from. And so, you know, and so my gosh, Declaration, what is it? You, what is it to mean? You were created equal? What can that possibly mean? That's where the questioning comes in. You know, I don't think so. I don't think we're created equal. What? You know, and so, and go on from there. And so just reading all of these different texts, Mary Wollstonecraft, uh, all very small excerpts, um, of course, um, because these core texts are embedded. It's not a separate program uh, that logistically is simply impossible at a community college. Um, uh, everyone's very jealous of their 60 credits. Um, and so the curricular, it's a very tight curriculum. Um, and so these texts are embedded in pre-existing um, general education courses. But still, we try to like free up those things and have them, and have them you know, form communities. Um, and, that's, you know, and so that's what education is about, is forming communities of questioning and liberating. And so whether it's the one-on-one -on -one Oxford tutorial or um, the my class, I'm only teaching two classes this semester, and it's 56 students. And so it's like, yes, okay, all right, that's okay. Um, I love them all. And so, uh, so it's wonderful. Um, and so that's what we try to do, um, to balance that sort of um, real desire for economic enfranchisement, uh, which we're very supportive of, and also just stepping back and saying, what does it mean? What do, what do you mean? Do you want to be good? What do you mean? What does that even mean? Uh, what does it mean? You're a political animal. You want to have relationships with people. You know, how does that look? What is that going to feel like? Um, and I'll just end with one other really great quote uh, from the most unlikely source. Um, years ago, I came across a quote that just resonates with me about the liberal arts. Um, liberal arts oftentimes are uh, are oftentimes criticized as being a little bit luxurious and unnecessary. And so this is especially in times of trauma and war. And so, for example, World War II had a lot of these arguments for the liberal arts. And one of them was this gorgeous speech from um, Duke University, 1943, by Wendell Wilkie. It's like, who is Wendell Wilkie? He's the failed uh, presidential candidate in 1940. And it's actually a beautiful speech. And there's just one phrase that just strikes, out, strikes me. He says, this is, wartime is precisely the time we have to think about these things. We have to preserve the liberal arts because we have to preserve, and he calls this the franchise of the mind. And that just term has just resonated with me. It's just a beautiful phrase to franchise, not in the sense of McDonald's franchise, although there's something there with economic freedom. Um, the franchise in the sense of freeing, it's this franchise of the mind that the liberal arts really hopes to preserve. Thank you. I'm, I'm still thinking about what you said, um, which I like very much, and especially the phrase um, stepping back, which you used a few times. I think that's central to my sense of a liberal arts education, that we are all um, in particular situations and circumstances, and yet there's a, a part of us that can step back, step outside that situation and reflect on it, and reflect on it together with others. Um, and so uh, I'm fond of the phrase, uh, 
Community of Learning, which Francis Oakley, the president of Williams College, used to title a book on the topic. Um, and there's a sense in which liberal arts learning allows us to form, encourages us to form communities to bring out, um, to help one another bring out our most thoughtful selves. And I, I, would, I would point to that. Um, and then I, I guess I'd also say, I think there's a longstanding tension in, in what we mean by the liberal arts, longstanding between, um, on the one hand, the connotation of liberating, which has come up already a few times, that the liberal arts somehow liberate, liberate us. But the other, the other suggestion is that these, uh, this is a form of learning for the free individual, that is someone who's not enslaved to their circumstances, someone who can be a citizen uh, in a full sense of their community. And the reason I say there's a tension there is because um, the sort of teaching that aims to encourage community and citizenship and speaking well to one another and writing well to one another um, is sometimes at odds with the emphasis on individual research and exploration and individuality. And um, there's a, a nice book uh, called Orders and Philosophers about this long-standing tension and how to understand liberal education that I've always found really, really helpful. So, um, you know, some people plump for one side or the other uh, in that debate, but I would just say that, that the tension between those different ideals of, of individuality and truth-seeking and research and, on the other hand, forming communities um, with shared understandings that can become the most thoughtful versions of themselves, that seems to me a constitutive tension. Great, thank you. Um, Stephanie, can you go next? I, I wanna make sure that we don't uh, lose you here in the uh, order. Yeah, I appreciate that. And it's great that you call on me when, when it's time for me to speak because um, of just the setup it make, would make it easier. So, so um, everything everybody has said is, is, is terrific. And I would just like to build on that with a couple of thoughts that relate more specifically to the liberal arts and climate. And um, so one of the things that I really valued in my liberal arts education and that I try to um, work with students um, as I teach them in liberal arts settings is to um, have them have valuable experiences with differences so that they appreciate ways of doing things that are different than the way they were brought up or that they were exposed to you know, prior to coming into a liberal arts setting. I think that um, having facilitated experiences such that it may not be comfortable, but students come to see the value of differences and appreciate that not everybody knows the same things that they do or had the same experiences or will react in the same way as they did. Another thing is um, critical thinking, you know, so that's a basic tenet of liberal arts education. But in this case, understanding misinformation and disinformation is just so critical nowadays and it's something that the liberal arts education really needs to grapple with. Um, there's so many people who have come through a liberal arts education and um, don't seem to have learned that. And so I think that this is something that we need to, we need to focus on more as we and do it more intentionally um, in the future. Um, and then the third thing is a sense of stewardship and reciprocity, a sense of responsibility um, for the world around us. And I think climate has brought this home to us um, more so than almost any other crisis. And here I also would like to uh, quote somebody, Sheila Watt Plotier, she's the former president of the Inuit Circumpolar Council, and in her testimony to the US Senate in 2005, she said, the Inuit hunter who falls through the depleting and unpredictable sea ice is connected to the cars we drive, the industries we rely upon, and the disposable world we have become. So through our small scale, you know, seemingly um, innocuous actions, we're actually causing and affecting change, you know, all around the world and communities and endangering people, you know, uh, in ways that we can't, many people can't imagine. And I think the liberal arts education is one way for for us to really see those connections and um, have them come literally, you know, come home to us, and so that we can understand them in a um, in the context of preparing us for the future. Thanks. Great, thank you, Stephanie, um, for that. And I think maybe building on that, I can 
kind of pass it off to the panelists to kind of decide which one of two directions I think would make sense to go in. Um, thinking about how the liberal arts should respond to the sort of multi-scale reconfigurations of civic life associated with climate change. So to questions of scale um, on the one hand, one road, and then another road we could go down, I think building off of what Stephanie just said, um, is thinking about the interconnectedness of place and the role of place and sort of the relationship of researchers and teachers to publics and places. What responsibilities do we have, or, uh, teachers and researchers of the liberal arts have to communities and ecosystems that we occupy? Um, so I think there's maybe two roads. So I pass it off to you guys to, to pick it up. I'll jump in, thank you. Um, I think we could in some ways have it braid these two questions together. Um, I think the, you know, the question of scale is so critical. I think I spent last year at the Institute for Advanced Study and often had rather tense debates around this question because often um, come in from the vantage of someone who really takes home in a very local place to be a serious reason that I'm even animated to, to think about these questions in this work. Sometimes when you're talking to uh, folks in, with other orientations, especially towards the global, um, it, is, it, it, it very quickly devolves into you're not working or thinking at, at the proper scale to actually address the, the issue of climate. And that's, that is an important pushback against just hyper-local conversations. Obviously, we can't you know, remake ecologies in our relations in one place and expect that that will, will cover the, the whole territory in relation to the, the questions and the problems that are opened up by quote unquote climate catastrophe or emergency. Um, but I think at the, on the other hand, that um, jump into the global can also lead to the blind spots that are often inherent in those kinds of discussions that, that frankly, um, have fascism built into them, their universality, um, that also are willing to throw away certain populations of people, species, life, non-human, um, a section of the ocean, if, if pressed hard enough when you go to, well, what is expendable in this? And coming from critical black studies vantage, that's the part that we have, that our liberal arts interdis radical interdisciplinarity says, as a no, like that's a that's a red line for us. You know, I'm speaking kind of in a collective, but for myself, even I'll just say, in terms of thinking climate, um, you know, what would it mean to really think about no place or no people or no species or no section of the planet as as radically disposable in those kinds of ways? Um, and I think um, that that is that that binds me to and has bound me to a kind of trying to do two scales at once in the work through the lab, having these very hyper local engagements where um, you know undergraduates, graduate students, um, artists, activists, organizers, filmmakers, et cetera, come together in one place, deal specifically and in real embodied ways with that local place, eat together, share, all those kinds of things, to actually experience community in that way. Um, but also to cross-pollinate that with other hyper-local um, engagements, and especially for the work that we're doing, also in the U.S. South, in black communities in the U.S. South. Um, so for example, um, we gathered this, as I mentioned, in August in in um, in Virginia, in the, in the Tidewater, we'll convene this summer, hosted by Dr. Justin Hosby at Berkeley, um, in New Orleans, which is his field site. We're hoping to have Tiana's um, gathering in another in 2025 in Jackson, Mississippi, centering food. And we want to not just us cross pollinating because that could be easy. A whole bunch of academics go from place to place and have a good time. Not exactly what we mean by cross pollinating. So taking undergraduates, graduate students and um, local youth in particular across these places so that we're not the only ones that are doing the moving. Um, and I think um, and I, th I think that. Um, that's a way for us of building out scale. And I'll just mention this as well. We did a zine um, on black ecologies that included fiction and interviews, original art, um, 
essays and some other stuff that was supposed to enhance the kind of scale even further at the larger scale, thinking diasporically, um, thinking about um, thinking with folks in South Africa, Trinidad and Tobago, Jamaica, across these different genres of writing and expression um, to so that, you know, we have these in-person, hyperlocal and cross-pollinating things. But there and that that because they're being staged across a particular region in the U.S., the South and black communities in the South, that having a kind of effective consciousness raising at the local and the regional and then putting it through other other um, digital publications and technologies at, in conversation with uh, yet other scales at the global. And I think that's, um, that's the way that we've been thinking about scale and also thinking about how we um, relate to place so that we're, we have these deep reciprocities um, with indigenous and black folks in particular. And we're not just coming in, taking information and leaving, or we just come have, again, have a good time and, and go to another place the following year. So th those are some of my thoughts about that. Thank you. Uh, sure, I'll jump in because I, I really like the emphasis on um, the local, and but then thinking about how to have a broader impact. I've been facing kind of the same question and, uh, from a different vantage point with this Citizens Thinkers Writers program that we started here, which um, was in a way <laughs> my own response to having been involved in a very global effort, this Yale and US college that Dean Lewis, who's here, was um, a, key, a leader of. Um, which was a fascinating project, but I, I, I feel that I learned from it how much the local does matter, and so I wanted to do something here in New Haven. Um, and I wanted to keep it small because of the importance of the particular and thinking, that you have to think with particular other people about particular issues in front of you. And it's a strange thing for a theorist to say, but a great enemy of, of, of thought is, is premature abstraction. Um, and so... I would just say that um, recently we've started to think in terms of a federal model, I guess. That is, if you can build a model that is local and small scale and thick and hope that it's an example of what can be built and then help others build similar models elsewhere, you can hope for more of a bottom-up kind of spread. And that seems to be kind of related to what you were saying. So, I, you know, I'd be interested in other people's thoughts if they've tried similar models. <laughs> Sorry. I thought I was, I thought my brain was, was on its way, but it'll take just a second to catch up. Um, the question about scale and thinking with climate and, and teaching about climate, um, you know, my, my primary reference point is the Pacific, where I'm from, um, and I, I write a little bit about the Anthropocene and climate change in the Pacific, and, and in a lot of the discourses around that, it's always striking to me how the comparative models are set up so that people say here on the continent or the East Coast can always say, okay, well, what's happening over there is equal to like three Manhattans or climate um, or sea level rise would put this place, you know, like Boston under underwater. Um, and in a sense, I always worry about how that privileges particular relations across space such that we need to actually apprehend some of these um, sites on their own terms instead of comparatively. Um, how you teach that in a classroom, I think, also requires you to get hyper-local um, to think about, say, New Haven on its own terms um, and to really think about the particularities of place. I find that students sometimes will be crushed over, like crushed under the enormity of the crisis um, and really need opportunities to work with their hands in order to process the ideas um, and to process the frameworks that they have to think through this with because it, it is existential. Uh, Hile, that's um, Great, and I wonder if I can jump in here because it, it, it seems like um, there's, 
there's a couple of ways of thinking about scale. One is we can think about the scale on which to understand or approach issues arising from climate change. We can think about you know, the scale of, of, of education uh, and mobility in that and you know, where people are learning. We can also think, though, about scaling as a, um, you know, a particular kind of capacity of thought, this ability to connect, to make connections between different scales, the local, the planetary, of you know, the, the, the sort of like human history and, and, and geological time, for instance. So um, I've had this question in mind, and Stephanie, maybe we can start with you, because I know that you've thought about it a little bit, but um, what, what resources, you know, do, can, you, can you think of experiences that you've all had in the liberal arts where you've successfully or unsuccessfully sort of cultivated scaling as a, as a way of, of, of thinking about the world um, and maybe in particular about climate issues? And, um, I come from a natural science background, and so, you know, our, our teaching has largely been grounded in the natural sciences. And one of the things that we did early on was, um, instead of, we had labs, and instead of standard, you know, labs where you're working with chemistry or something like this, what we did was we, um, there was a research um, um, oriented uh, viewer um, where you could actually look at global data sets. And so we were, having the students engage with these global data sets and um, working with them, you know, sort of slicing and dicing the ocean and the atmosphere and looking at um, where cities are located and how sea level rise would affect them. And so we were trying to, to have the students see that when we talked about a process that you could also see um, kind of the ripple effects and you could see the context of it. And I think that that, that, that um, worked out pretty well. Um, another way that we were able to tie that scaling um, to, say, um, to personal experiences is we would have students do concept maps, um, you know, have, have them do a concept map individually first about once, in, once we introduce some topic, um, and uh, so that they could, you know, articulate kind of ground their impressions of it, their concerns, and, you know, what they know about it, but then have them work in teams um, to actually merge the concept maps. And so then they were able to see the, sort of the complexity of what they, of the issue that they were dealing with. And then taking it further, they would go around the room and they would look at what different teams had done. And um, so then they could actually see what, um, you know, just how broad many of these issues were and how they touched so many different facets. And, um, often we would then connect them with what an expert would do or um, it, with the same topic or in the case of the Arctic, we, did, we showed them what an indigenous resident um, would do talking about their relationship to their environment. So we're trying to span this global and local at the same time. Um, and just um, connecting that then to what I had said before and also what um, somebody has said about the students feeling crushed under the crisis. Uh, we, we um, you know, it can easily just be gloom and doom, right? You know, you can talk about, you can show people on this and say, and this is what the world is going to look like, that you'll be inhabiting it. And uh, so one way to, to um, you know, kind of uh, add some agency to that, of course, is to talk about actions. And this was something, um, your question about places and peoples, um, brought up the, the difficulties, the challenges that we both face as professors, especially I think the natural sciences, where students would ask us, you know, what, what can we do about this? You know, you painted this picture, you know, what can we do? And uh, for many uh, um, natural scientists, this was a really hard question to answer. And I've actually heard some of my colleagues would say, hey, that's a political question. But over time, you know, um, I've come to realize that, you know, if you had a, a researcher who was talk, a faculty member whose their expertise was in COVID, of course they would talk about vaccines, right? And so the place of liberal arts in talking about what can you do, so it's applied, it's not all theoretical, you know, you're actually talking about actions that you can take, I think, links between the scales and the places and peoples. Thanks. Um. 
No, that all sounds great. Um, and just think just everything that, uh, everyone is saying just, um, just about actions, the local and then the broader global. Um, it just, when I, uh, was thinking about this previously, it just brought to me the image of borders. Um, and so, so obviously borders are, uh, always a hot topic in our, in human history. Um, you can even look at the, at the today and I don't want to get into politics, but you know, you can think of Texas, Ukraine and uh, Gaza. And, you know, we, so humans, um, we've often, and we have appropriated that language for a therapeutic model of just like, you know, know your borders and don't violate my borders and so on. Um, so borders are really, um, people like borders. Um, and we like, uh, the local, and that kind of indicates kind of the local and how do you scale up to that? Um, and that can be, um, sometimes scary when you said fascism for the first, for some reason, uh, uh, in, a, in the Aeneid, Virgil's Roman mandate, you know, oh, remember that, you know, he's the main character, Aeneas is the main character and his dad tells him, Aeneas, you know, other, other cultures do better sculptures than we Romans do, but we, we're good fascists. No, not really. He said, but we, we rule and we promote peace and that's your mandate. And so that's a little bit, that sounds nice, but it's a little bit scary too. Um, so this, and again, this, uh, this brings up all kinds of political questions regarding, regarding action and stuff. Um, and when I was thinking of this, I hate to tell more stories, but I was thinking of this, I thought of, um, you know, the Genesis Cain and Abel. And I just thought of, you know, the other brothers, um, you know, have different, have different modes of being, um, and uh, the shepherd, Abel, goes into the commons and he goes into kind of broader space where he can have his little sheep and take care of them. And it's, it's a beautiful, broad space. Um, Cain has a, has a definite, uh, you know, farming is a definite, you can only do so many acres at a time and you, do, and you want product, product from there. And so he has a very different understanding of the relationship between the local versus, well, I want to say Abel's more global. Uh, understanding um and so and so i'm i heard this i think somebody i'm I think i'm getting this from a lecture down at louisiana like 30 years ago maybe rob mcmahon i can't remember i can't remember this, this uh, many years ago but he gave a beautiful little quick little uh, psychology of those two he says look what does cain so what does cain do he says abel come over to my place come over to my space and he kills him and he either thinks that God, and then when he's confronted by God, he either thinks God is stupid and can't see, so he's not omniscient, or thinks God is not omnipotent. And so that understanding of property, like everyone was saying, it kind of makes you sort of narrow. And we hope the liberal arts can kind of break us out of this. And the environment speaks, because then it, God says, the blood is crying from the ground, buddy. You know, I can hear that. And so Cain just isn't aware of that. He's myopic. He doesn't wear those kind of, that vision is much broader and that, um, and that, you know, and that has to be taken into account for. Thank you. Um, I would, I would hesitate and push against, um, and I think this is part of the liberal arts enterprise that we're taking the, the potential for reopening questions. I think we should as uh, this is me throwing on my geography head, <laughs> we shouldn't assume that scales have a natural kind of relationship to one another. And I think especially this is critical in the moment where we're seeing a transformation of even the subject of the liberal subject is being remade. Perhaps we could go with Sylvia Winter's schema and add a man three to thinking about how the scale of, of life is being rearticulated before our very eyes through both post-lunar exploration, um, molecular understandings of life itself that are literally genomic, but also behavioral and, and related to often to platform capital. And, and I think deep sea exploration and mining and all that, I think we're, we may be at the, pre and, and an AI labor imaginary horizon, even if it is fake, <laughs> even if it's not like a real, <laughs> really about to, to be what it is held out. I think we're watching scale shift and how we need to be thinking about this shift before our very eyes um, and in real significant ways. And so I think part of our training and retooling of the liberal arts is to not assume that scale adheres 
beyond its very specific this very specific historicity and that that is a point of possibility for us i mean you know i think with ruthie gilmore and others work others work um in geography thinking about how you use how you use and manipulate scale politically um jump they you know i think she's referred to it as jumping scale or something like that in in other contexts um and i think how do we and I wanted to bring in another scale as well, um, time. And I think the liberal arts, we were talking over this over lunch, um, you know, the liberal, the, the time scale of urgency versus like what the liberal arts time scale of like, I picked up Katrina and then 10 years later, I'm like doing things that are related and might be transformative for the climate. Whereas I think, you know, the modeling of universities at this point really is, um, I think someone mentioned this earlier, towards a more direct, here's a job <laughs> when, you, when you move out of this role, which the liberal arts are not necessarily that geared for. Um, so I think also what I'm trying to get us to do is to shake up how we think about time scales and place based scales um, think about them more analytically and have our students think about them so that we can anticipate politically and, and practically and in other ways um, what scaling will mean in our in our present and future again with an understanding that the very territory of the liberal subject is transforming um, and in part, that climate understanding of Anthropocenic discourse is part of that tipping point, I would say. So, thank you. <laughs> can, I, can I jump in? Yes. Um, you mentioned urgency, and that's a question that I'm particularly interested in, and I, I wonder how, what, what you all make of this. Um, liberal arts has for a long time been thought to presume leisure. I mean, we create these spaces and we create these times in which we study more than we could if we were just in the midst of action. And yet, around climate change, there's, as you said, such a sense of urgency, especially maybe for our students, but in general. And the urgency threatens to eclipse the space for thought and research because do we have the time? Um, and th so that seems... And, and yet, and yet, clearly, the motivation to study these issues uh, uh, also comes from the urgency. So, how do we balance? How, how do we balance um, sort of what is frankly a kind of leisure that liberal education requires, and this sense, this demand for action? Uh, I think that's a one challenge that the liberal arts faces at the moment. Yeah, I think that I will say that. Um the, like the crisis of climate change is always like it is it is pressing and also the timelines and the horizons for it are quite long um, uh, folks working in native and indigenous studies have done a lot of work around um, renaming like the tipping point of the Anthropocene as being empire and settler colonialism right that we can look at that as the thing that starts to make that geologic impact um, on our environments. Um, and also, the, the liberal arts education model helps us to see climate crisis as actually like part of this whole composite of political, economic, and social shifts around it. So as I was meditating on like how I know climate crisis, there were two touch points that emerged for me. The first was, um, the wildfires in Lahaina uh, in August of last year, which was um, noted as the worst natural disaster in the history of the islands, killing over 100 people and leveling uh, one of our most important historic towns. Um, but a lot of folks pointed out that the conditions for that wildfire had been set 150 years prior uh, with the plantation economy rerouting all of the water um, that used to be there and then building luxury developments on top of those plantation infrastructures such that a place that should have been verdant was bone dry. And furthermore, that that became the mechanism by which 
multinational corporations came in to retool the legal systems that determine who gets access to water in Hawaii. So residents of Maui for years before that had been under uh, water conservation um, acts all the while that the golf courses were springing up all around them and watering um, the courses and filling the swimming pools uh, and doing all of those things. And so, um, uh, you know, a lot of folks have pushed back and said, well, that's absolutely not a natural disaster. And it may be related to climate change, but the conditions are set under a different timeline than we've been trained to apprehend it as. Um, the second touch point that I just want to call in here, um, I was living in Austin, Texas in 2021 when we experienced what is now called the Great Texas Freeze or the Texas Power Crisis, um, which knocked out the power grid in large sections of the state while um, everybody was experiencing rapid and sub sustained sub-zero temperatures uh, in a state where houses are designed to shed heat. Um, and you know, it was it, the conditions were terrifying on its own. You know, there was no food, there was no water, and there was no warmth uh, for any of us. But it was also set in the high point of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so all of the modes of community organizing and community care that usually emerge to form sites of resilience were just not. Um, a part of that, you know, women were going into their cars uh, with their babies to keep them warm and dying of asphyxiation because you were too afraid to get together with other people or people were too afraid to come together in warming shelters. Um, and so that, you know, the, the ecological disaster of it was one part, but the second part was the thing that actually I feel like I've held on to as one of the most profound examples of the ways in which we have not only lost survivability, but a lot of communities have lost resilience. I would, I would jump in and say from the vantage, I think, and this resonates in some ways um, with folks in indigenous studies, from the vantage of black studies, it is both like the pressing urgency of right now and also the the <laughs> serial urgencies that have to be thought in, in relation to liberal arts, especially of education. And so I think part, you know, I'm thinking with Bador, Allegra and other folks who push back against crisis as the, the formulation or catastrophe as the formulations that we use precisely because um, the world has ended every day since 1492 for many populations and groups and like, um, you know, the people that suffered at Katrina or other things that we could go down a litany, um, that, that also brings to different, like, I guess, critical questions, what scale catastrophe happens at and what scale is like, how, how bound our understandings are of that to, um, to a certain kind of Judeo-Christian theology around ap the apocalyptic as a global thing rather than if one community dies, there's already been an apocalypse or something like that. So I think I think part of it is negotiating that um, that reality that enslaved people in the tide water um, have all these narratives from immediate post emancipation period taken as part of the Works Progress Administration um, interviews, saying my sister and everybody was sold to the deep south to clear forests and to make cotton plantations and die with holes in their hands, right? The black folks have had a different relationship to understanding that climate, what we are now bundling together at, under the adages or euphemisms, climate, even climate emergency, climate crisis are, are precisely all these kinds of, of histories. And Nathan Hare said in, in that 1970 black ecology essay, like, housing is a is an ecological issue if you're black right like if we start piecing it together from a the certain vantage um then we have to we have a different kind of timeline and that doesn't that doesn't push back against the kind of radical urgency of like global climactic crisis but i think it does and i, I think we might want to cultivate um, especially insofar as labor extraction and expansionary global capital um, 
their visions of leisure are very narrow and, and market oriented, the liberal arts might actually be a decent space to think about leisure in the more classical sense of like just non-work time. Um, expanding that might actually be good for the climate. So I think like what what would happen if we we were all reading rather than running to do other things or doing I mean not to put it so simply, but but I do think there are we might actually capitalize on that opening that that we're not doing anything that's productive, quote unquote, when we're engaged in liberal arts education because we probably need to do less. <laughs> yeah, may I um yeah, it's all fantastic. Um, <clears throat> just, uh, I'm sure we've all seen those surveys uh, about this. Of course, we all, us older people, like to make fun of younger generations, and so it's uh, so that uh, I actually heard a young person say that her generation says, "Yeah, I'm, not, I'm never going to have children. I can't possibly even take care of myself." And so there's a sort of like it, there's a sort of crisis mode there. Um, I think also that they just feel these kind of, you know, I think that's a great expression, serial crises going on. Um, right, and as far as what kind of, um, uh, just two other points, um, just what you said about just um, living that kind of leisurely life, a life of, it's almost like, um, you know, People go on retreats and stuff. Uh, they do that stuff. Um, and it's precisely to step back from everything, from that kind of transitory, transactional uh, work in order to do that. Um, and so the, to me, that raised the issue of, um, of luxury. I guess I was thinking of, uh, for some reason, I was thinking of the Aeneid a lot and just the Roman understanding of luxury as less, uh, not very, you know, oh, that's like, you know, it's terrible, that understanding of luxury. But... That's what liberal arts is oftentimes seen as, is a luxury. Um, and that's what climate, what's, that's what discussions about climate change are. That's one thing that ties the two, is that climate change is often seen as a, as a luxury for people to talk about when you don't have to generate 900 calories a day for your five kids at some poor, at some poor space. Um, and so, um, so maybe the answer is to... Um, say no these are not uh those are not luxuries or they're necessary luxuries they're luxuries not in the roman sense of morally reprehensible but luxuries are just necessary things we have to do the liberal arts has they require leisure and they require no longer working briefly so you can step back and have that space to precisely do that um and I had an unrelated point. Uh, oh, just, uh, again, something that uh, you all said just about um, uh, kind of uh, motivating the crisis mentality. Um, it just struck me that the, um, and we had this discussion on climate change where we were doing Dante's Inferno with my students. Of course, you know, you, it's a little videotape of, you know, Dante and Virgil going to hell and seeing all these crazy people. And the students always know right away that they have no idea what they have no self-knowledge. And it's really wonderful to have my students uh, talk about that. But they also pointed out the weather and that the climate has a big impact on everyone is very reflective of that. So in the lustful, they're all getting blown around by the wind and they can't touch each other. And so, um, and then you get into the very bottom of hell in this Judeo-Christian you know, system, and Satan is not frying, he's, he's stuck, he's stuck in the cold um, because he's totally immobile. And so I make, I'm saying, mention all that to make the point that um, uh, maybe something going off JT said that the crisis is, the symbols are very heavy. Um, climate has a lot of very, and that's the problem with it being beautiful, you when you see you know the beautiful glacier cutting off um all of that just like in dante the the weather is very heavily symbolic and i think that changes our discourse a little bit and maybe has some small imp on the one hand it should enliven us that this is a tragic that these might be tragic moments here or in the past or in the future um but it also they might also be kind of seen as almost hyperbolic and also it, be aware of the heavy symbolic weight that all of these have that those people in hell weren't aware of, and that um, but the, the hopefully Dante uh, was a, was aware of eventually. 
That, that, that's great, and I wonder, I wonder if, if picking up on some of these um, I, ideas which I take to, to connect you know, um, liberal arts to uh, the, 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 the kind of world that we in, envision and might want to inhabit, um, if, we might, if we might sort of move, or not move from there, but, but take on board in this discussion uh, a... Um, maybe something that is more kind of technical and focused on the practice of liberal art, the practice and organization of liberal arts learning and education. So, um, Stephanie, I'm going to go back to you because you had a great question that we, we had discussed before the panel um, that raised the issue of, of general education requirements. So oftentimes liberal arts programs are a place to make claims about, you know, what, what folks are, or all students who go through um, a, a post-secondary education ought to be exposed to or ought to learn. Um, and uh, I think that this is some sc school, this is an interesting space in which to think about climate futures. You know, should there be general education uh, requirements that are futures oriented um, around sustainability and climate literacy, for instance? Um, intentionally focused on preparing students for futures that we know will or may come. Um, uh, or if not, how should, we, how, how should we think about general education as, as a project that has sometimes been taken up by the liberal arts and sometimes not, but might bear on climate issues today? So I wanted to kick this to you, Stephanie, but I, I, I think that other folks on the panel will, will also have thoughts. Yeah, thanks. Um, I appreciate that. So we, um, so at Arizona State University, we just are implementing a sustainability general education requirement starting in fall of 2024. So you might, that's a little bit surprising given that ASU is known for sustainability. But you know, for a variety of reasons, um, this is, this, the time was right, and so we're implementing it right now. And um, just uh, first to tie back to the, the urgency um, question uh, or issues that came up, I just wanted to um, mention that, of course, climate change is intergenerational, right? So we're going to have a series of crises, a um, series of urgencies that are rolling out you know, over the coming decades. And a lot of the change, really big changes that we're expecting to see will be happening in a couple of decades. And so the people that we're teaching in undergraduates right now will be in their 40s then, which is a prime time to show leadership. And so I think, you know, the, the scale, of course we need to take action now, but we also need people who are in place who are prepared, you know, to, to respond and to be proactive. And so that leads me to the general education. So um, I'll be teaching one of these general education classes, and um, we had to decide what, we're, what aspects we're going to focus on. And of course, all of um, li the liberal arts education prepares you, you know, so you have scientific literacy, you have math literacy, you often have requirements for something historical, in, in history, you know, culture specifically, and then of course writing and things like, you know, different ways to uh, for critical thinking and of course they do prepare you for the future but then there's other aspects that i think are, are not being taught so um that that liberal arts would really benefit from so um and i, I had this actually the, the realization for this for me came from an experience i had where i was i was uh, teaching this class and I, I rolled out all of the impacts the best we knew them and we you know where there's going to be droughts where there's going to be flood what, what cities will be flooded um or heavy rainfalls, where this, what areas along the coast can be flooded. And the students at the end of this, you know, and I said for the first time in human history, we actually know approximately where and when all of these things will play out. And the students just were sort of stunned and they looked at me and I said, you know, and finally one of them blurted out, well, what are you doing about it? Right? And so it, it really, you know, they're, they're expecting our generation to take a lot of actions, and, and we haven't. And maybe in part it's because of the education that we've had. So how can we prepare students um, so that they're open to these kinds of ideas, that they you know, are willing to, as I said at the beginning, to, to feel that they have a responsibility and a sense of stewardship. So one of the things that we're talking about is you know, that uh, we're talking about complex systems, you know, that there's interdependent 
dependencies and reciprocity. And there's lots of different ways to, to teach about that. Another one that people have touched on here is that the conditions today are legacies of decision making that has been made in the past. And today's, you know, the corollary is that today's decisions will shape future trajectories for future generations. But there's context specific differentiation. Not all places, not all peoples are the same and things change through time, space, and according to values. If we can help train students to envision scenarios of alternative futures and then rigorous evaluation of their implications on multiple scales, I think that this will take us a long ways towards opening up to new perspectives and then also giving skills about what, um, which trajectories they might want to follow, where they could contribute to this problem. And then finally, of course, you know, um, just coming back to the very beginning, um, in order to really engage in that, you have to have that sense um, of care, you know, that we are all, um, this is our home for all of us, right? And to have, make, find ways to, to draw the connections between, you know, who we are now and then our future generations, our past generations, and then, you know, um, instill that sense of, you know, as I, I've said, responsibility, but then also, you know, a, a willingness to make informed decisions. Thank you. I think for us at Rutgers, Tiana and I, and some other folks in our extended network, we did originally use the kind of pipeline language, but given the oil, <laughs> given oil or gas and those infrastructures, we backed away from that. <laughs> uh, talking more about circuitries and and that kind of um, nodal. <laughs> you know, network kind of metaphors. But I think um, that that's part of it is, is um, I think having, having students, having young, young people um, experience the possibilities for thinking differently, beginning with K through 12 and extended all the way through graduate school and like early matriculation into jobs and all of that. We've been trying to, again, have this, we come together for short bursts of time but that allowing for the planting of, of deeper long-term relationships that are otherwise kinds of relationships, I think is, is, um, is critical. I also think, uh, I think it's also um, difficult within the context of universities and the, and the model of um, donors and all of that, because I think um, part of what we could do is really emphasize, um, you know, maybe underthought um, fields and disciplines in relation to these questions that I think, you know, for example, from a black studies orientation, we've had a lot to say about <laughs> ecologies and, and climate if there's a different reading praxis that we are, we're, we're engaged in. But I think that's intention going and, and I guess enlivening or resuscitating certain traditions as they already exist in this rich interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary frame. Um, is sometimes in tension with donors wanting, you know, a specific kind of new this or new that. And I think that's part of, um, part of it is like, how do we um, reinforce um, the spaces like indigenous and black studies that have, have been thinking in this frame um, for quite some time. Um, and I think, yeah, I think, again, I want to just emphasize the liberal arts. I think we often have this vision, the life of the mind, as an isolated, bifurcated, we have a body, we have a mind. I mean, we could go through all of the kind of dualisms that, that orient that and that we need to unmake. But again, I think gathering in place um, and having the field school model is a way of, of reorienting the, the various frames that we know through um, and that that's a critical part of it as well, epistemologically and, and and, and shaking down some of the kinds of, or shaking loose from some of the kinds of very um, deep ontological um, assumptions of, that come out of the liberal arts around, you know, just again, binaries, you know, resource and, and what is considered disposable, right? Like unmaking all of those, so thank you. We had um, a great conversation over lunch circling around these things and, and how we think about the place of the university as the site for the liberal arts education and and all of the um, difficulties that are kind of embedded in that. I think one of the things that I feel anxious about um, uh, that students learn when they come to these spaces is we're also teaching them to 
figure out like who's an expert um, on something. Uh, and they look to these spaces as the sites of expertise when the sites of expertise are actually very rarely contained here. Um, and so, you know, the field school or the field site does a lot of that work in decentering this, you know, the container of the institution as the place for learning. Um, it also requires us to really think carefully in place in order to train students not in gaining expertise necessarily, but to also be trained in careful paying attention and careful listening, right? Those kinds of things that happen, um, those forms of expertise that are cultivated within communities that have been in site and on site for long periods of time. Um, nobody notices climate change as carefully as somebody who has been in place and in community. Um, so those feel really important uh, in terms of you know, how we think about where the liberal arts education might be and, and who might be those teachers. Just on the question of general education, briefly, uh, I, I think I want to say three brief things. One, I continue to think it's an abdication of responsibility on the part of universities not to have their faculty come together and decide what it is an education, an educated person should know. Um, we fall into a, a pattern of allowing the fragmentation of research trajectories to create a fragmentation of educations for our students, which creates lots of opportunities and for originality and creativity and individuality, but which does punt on this fundamental question that you asked, what should uh, a general education consist of? And, and, and then the two other points, very briefly, I'd say, in terms of the broadest challenges that we face, especially in light of the climate issue, um, we remain ensconced in this uh, situation where science is stranded from non-science. And we have produced generations now who do not really know how to think about science together with uh, the insights of literature or ethics. And so you can witness the sort of awkward, clumsy way that students are trying to work their way into these topics about AI, by talking about safety. Uh, there's a whole awkward language through which they're trying to recreate ethics. Um, uh, and I, I, I don't claim anyone has solved the problem. I mean, since the early 19th century, um, when science and religion uh, were really came to seem as intense competitors in colleges in America, um, you know, the liberal arts were more associated with the religion side, and so science came to seem something alien or separate. Um, but this is a major challenge that I think universities should be looking. How, how do we integrate the study of nature from the modern scientific perspective with the study of nature and human beings in the world in other forms? And linked to that question, last point is just um, the place of human beings in nature, I think is a clear question that, that the climate issue raises. Is it uh, is anthropomorphism another prejudice, or is it the precondition of, of responsibility and stewardship and value? That is, um, why do we care about climate change? Change is not always bad. We want to preserve something about, is it other species or our own species? We then have to ask why. Why even preserve humans? What's worth preserving? Hans Jonas in 1979 wrote this hugely influential book, on responsibility, in which he said what we're really preserving is the idea of responsibility. Humans are the creatures who take responsibility. And um, we're not preserving their happiness or their interests. It's if we don't preserve humans, that very fact about the world, taking responsibility, uh, will no longer exist. And that would be problematic. And there, there are other ways to understand our, our stewardship and responsibility and care, to use the words that Stephanie was using. Um, but I think a general education for the future has to grapple with science, with the place of humans in nature, and with the difficulties of bringing faculty from scattered fields together into serious conversation. I'm aware of the time, um, but I, I thank you for that um, point, Brian. I, I want to give you all a chance to respond to or pick up anything that he just said and then 
we'll kind of wrap things up in a few minutes and go to Q and A. Um, yeah, I just uh, I've, I have responses to each of his points, which I agree with, but uh, um, I'll just say a couple of things. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the most I think just one of the almost the elephant in the room is that you know the role of humans in nature. It's like you know, and so and I'm not being mocking, but you know, the last passenger pigeon did not mourn. Now it's been wonderful the neurology of animals; the animals mourn occasionally, but the last passenger pigeon did not mourn the passing of his species or see some larger global issue. You know, it's us, it's the humans, and therefore that comes with precisely that ethical responsibility. Um, um, that you know, the, that per, probably the rest of the world does not have. Um, and secondly, right, I think that I think that integration of science and and all those other things is so important. Um, is to, just the notion of the a priori and the a posteriori knowledge that students just don't get it. And so I think that we all and we all have problems with that. And so just the final point, um, just that the place of gen ed in the liberal arts and perhaps climate change, one might be the perception of beauty. Um, that we really have to realize that this is, you know, that there's what Rudolf Otto, uh, uh, American thinker, called the, the new, we don't have to go all say that it's a creative world, created. Um, Stephanie used the word stewardship, which I think is wonderful. Um, but Rudolf Otto called this the kind, of, the kind of numinous quality of things. And so I think that's really just something that we have to be um, appreciative of. Thank you so much. I'll just... Um, throw into the conversation in relation to like overall general education and some of your comments. I think in geography and Africana, coming from that vantage, of course, much like other academic space, you know, intellectual spaces within the academy have, um, you know, the kind of neoliberal hyper specialization and all that, which I hear you saying is is a part of it. But I do think, especially um, both of those, their kind of genealogies have some offerings for thinking about. Um, how we have a, a general education in general because of the ways that they both have taken up problems as their primary orientation historically. And I think um, also just the, just something about the kind of genealogy of black studies and Africana studies coming out of its formal institutional history because there's also all of the history that predates it with, you know, the, you know, Association for the Study of Africa. Uh, of Negro life and history and all those kinds of things that predate a full institutionalization or departmentalization of black studies. But even with the formal institutionalization that comes, for example, San Francisco State um, um, in the in the you know late 60s and early 70s out of stu student protests, um, folks folks didn't have a preordained kind of hyper specialization in mind. It was like, you come to learn black studies consciousness and then you go do a myriad of things. And I think that that, like we, we're not prone to necessarily see what's often um, written off as hyper particular or hyper specific to a set of people as perhaps a wellspring of like, how we approach this question, but I think, again, that idea that we needed black studies trained psychologists, physicians, scientists, historians, et cetera, as an originating model for, for that interdiscipline, radical interdiscipline, is, is one w thing that we could say about a possibility for looking backwards for another kind of future for the liberal arts. And I think geography is similar. Um, you know, I'm still working out what geography means for me because <laughs> this is my first time officially in a geography space. I'm a trained historian. But the fact that Tiana and I are in the department with the state climatologists in some ways makes me very nervous. And then at other points, it makes me very hopeful for what is possible if we have students who are the students being the ones that will learn all those things. I'm not, I probably would not do GIS, let alone learn climate science. So in the, in the ways that the state climatologist knows it. But I think um, having students who are shuttling in those ways between those different things and with us, especially in geography, very, you know, for a long time in, in relation to social sciences, um, and humanities in really centering the climate. I think these may be two spaces where we could think about it. And I think um, the point about the, the anthropomorphic and, and all of that, I, I mean, I don't know. I think it's, you know, I think, um, you know, I'm 
maybe I'm influenced by the new materialisms or all of those kinds of things. I think there is a there's a healthy relationality between um, all of these things. And I think sometimes when humans think they're leading the way in a certain conversation, plants and things are also drawing us along and we're evolving in relation to them in ways that um, that make a kind of um, the the subject position that was anticipated by you all's comments, um, especially from the vantage of indigenous and black studies, um, not as straightforward, and also with the new materialisms and, you know, Denise Ferreira da Silva and other folks who are thinking about how all things perform a certain kind of labor. Um, so I think so what I think that gets us to the question of that doesn't eclipse the question of like, wh what do we see as the problem and how do we see ourselves in the problem? I think that's, um, but I just wanted to say that there are, um, that we, that again, I, I guess just infuse it back into the conversation, the need to challenge the the subject of, of the liberal arts, the liberal subject of the liberal arts. Um, and, and also, I guess taking, again, geography and Africana as having these other orientations towards a certain kind of problem orientation, but not necessarily as the kind of model that you um, brought forward about us gathering as a council to say what everyone should know. This is a different orientation that I think, you know, just putting it on the table that there are other approaches to that. Thank you. I don't think I can um, top what has been said at this table, but um, I do spend a lot of time thinking about, you know, what these institutions do and, um, you know, the, the fallacy of the suspension of time and labor to have these magical years of a life of the mind when in fact, you know, this, these institutions run, uh, they, we're, they are workplaces, they are labor places and students that come here when they're learning, they are doing work, right? Careful thinking is work. Um, and you know these institutions have kind of functioned under this fantasy that you know you suspend all other labors and have these leisurely spaces when in fact like that has been completely premised on unpaid domestic labor that you outsource. Um, uh, caregiving is very difficult to do in these spaces for all kinds of intentional ways. Um, and so I, I always wanna make a call for orienting ourselves to the work of this work, um, because I think it's so important, um, especially when we are imagining the liberal subject of the liberal arts. Uh, and in terms of uh, anthro, um, uh, oh my gosh, I'm losing my words. Anthropomorphic. Um, uh, anxieties. Uh, I always come back to the work of Leanne Simpson. Um, and her conceptualization of us having diplomatic relations with non-human kin. Uh, and if we think about ourselves as being in relations of diplomacy, uh, I think that's a really nice way of re-envisioning how we um, are in conversation with the worlds around us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Stephanie, can you uh, come in last word here? Sure. Just to go to the um, anthropomorphism. So I had a colleague who used to say, "Hey, the planet would be just fine without us. You know, it'll it'll do just fine with climate change. You know, it it you know bounces around and it does all these different things, um, and um, it'll stand withstand this and weather this as well." And I just felt that that was so. Um, <laughs> That was so awful, and you know, it was like, you know, uh, what about all the people, you know, who are just, you know, going to face really, really challenging, you know, circumstances. You know, there's going to be climate refugees. You know, there already is, both within, you know, nations and between them. And you know, there was this this quote by somebody else who said, you know, the three choices are adaptation, mitigation, or suffering. But there's going to be suffering with adaptation and mitigation too. So I mean, the scale of what's before us is really, is really huge, and we need to enlist everybody in coming at this problem from every direction that they possibly can, because um, we need a lot of minds thinking about how to sort of soften the transitions. But it's, um, you know, that we can't diminish the extent of 
um, of displacement and really um, challenging times that are ahead. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that, Stephanie. And thank you, everyone, so much for your really thoughtful and um, thought-provoking uh, comments. Um, I guess just to wrap up the sort of very, very briefly, I just want to to quote, um, I think, Hannah Arendt, thinking with Aristotle, it seems to me here that we all in various ways are thinking what we are doing. And it seems like that's also part of the task moving forward that takes various forms. Um, but uh, I, I think maybe just to end there with that from our side. And now we'll open it up to questions uh, from you all in the audience. So I guess there's a microphone. Thanks. Um, so one influential version of the liberal arts, at least historically, was um, cultivation of habits, even virtues, more than sets of knowledge. And I think there's been nervousness in Western modernity, at least about that. Professor Garston mentioned the religion and science divide. And certainly as our contexts are more and more pluralistic, there's less of a sense that perhaps we can agree about shared starting points or even a telos that we're aiming towards. So I think in our liberal arts conversations, we often turn to seemingly neutral skills or maybe a, a restricted list of intellectual virtues, so critical thinking or breadth of interest. But I've heard today other habits and virtues. Um, Professor Furman mentioned care and openness, for example. Others mentioned skills that matter for the field or even a, a sense of beauty. So I suppose my question is, you know, is naming the challenge of the climate a way to bring back attention in college to the cultivation of habits and virtues amidst assumed pluralism of starting point? If we have this common problem or mission, is it a way that we can bring back, if we want to, attention to habits and virtues? Um, yeah, yeah, I think so. I, I think I think students sometimes experience it this way when they're thinking about the question that Stephanie mentioned, that what to do, and um, they may think in terms of policies, but they also think in terms of personal habits. Uh, I remember talking to an undergraduate who had told me that um, she had given up Amazon, and this required major changes in her rhythm of life, and the structure of her desires, and the pace at which she could expect to. Um, satisfy her desires. I mean, these are foundational ethical concerns that go back, you know, to the Romans or Greeks, if you want. Um, so there, I, I guess I'd say I, I've seen that happening amongst students, and it's something that we could um, lean into or discuss or teach. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I agree. I think that, I think that, um, you know, for Aristotle, the, the virtues, you know, you require that, that kind of habitual action. And, and we think that too in the popular culture. I mean, every, we all have books on our little shelf about the 10 habits of how to lose 50 pounds or the ten, or whatever, the Stoics, the Stoic habits, you know, and so, and so, but maybe, yeah, I mean, I hadn't thought of having an open and frank discussion. My student, I mean, there's always sort of like you toss at the beginning of the semester, always toss them like, you know, the, the checklist of what you should do and, you know, you know, time management skills and all of that. But right, there's not, you know, because at least, you know, our demogra our student population is so fluid, has so many variables, you know, so if you mentioned childcare is so burdensome, right? So before you do anything, you've got to look at the DOE calendar, the Department of Education calendar to be sure if you're having an event that it's not teacher conference day and that the, that the parents, students can be there. Right? And so, so it's those kinds of variables. And so, um, and so, yeah, so it's kind of in, maybe an open and frank discussion about, you know, the inclusion of those virtues and those that are, you know, fully brought to bear by habit. So I have a question. Um, just before I came here, I happened to read William Paley in the late 17th century 
or 18th century said at Cambridge that the university exists to form the minds and moral sensibilities of the students. The assumption at Cambridge in 1785 was that both individual conduct and social order pleasing to God can be known and taught. And there's a sort of, I take as a sort of an implication being, you know, sort of a reservation on how much we really know. And I was struck by that in terms of the debate b between whether we should ask whether humans deserve to be, to survive, given what we've done. And it could be asked theologically, it could be asked ethically, and so on. I think that's a, 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 a much better topic in liberal arts than showing slides of where, of land that will be flooded. Um, you know, and I think using words like training and skills and teams of students, the, the vocationalism of academia uh, is tempting for liberal arts, but ultimately, it's like what CEOs have told me about business schools. You know, we want you not to train, we want you to educate. We can do the training. So we want you to educate, do what you can do best. And it kind of seems that, that that maybe paradox or what you wouldn't expect coming from business it might be something that liberal arts might want to follow in terms of climate change, that ironically that, that could be more effective in terms of uh, climate change in liberal arts. I'm wondering what you think of that. Does anybody, Stephanie, do you want to, I don't know if you want to come in here, maybe, or? Sure. Right, so I think, I think liberal arts, as somebody said at the outset, you know, it's really important to talk about, you know, learn how to frame problems and to, um, and, you know, you're, the way you're framing it, you know, do humans deserve to, to live? Is one is one thing that um, it, it's worth talking about. Um, it's also at the same time, I think liberal arts are such a place for um, future leaders. You know, I think that you know all of the studies have shown that it's um, opening up with the mind and new perspectives. You know, is is some of the best background you can have. I won't use training. Um, <laughs> For for um, for the new opportunities and possibilities that we don't know um, even what they'll be at this point, and at the same time, it's important to also learn about the world around you. Just as it's important to learn about sort of the cultural and philosophical world around you, it's really important to learn about the the context within which you live, environmentally too, and so. There's different ways of teaching about that um, than also based in big challenges and big problems. Um, then, then there is, um, you know, I think that there's just been a long history in the different fields about how they address different things. But we're all working from problems, and I think that that's a really important part of the liberal arts is to to learn these many different ways of thinking and how we approach them. Great, thank you. I wonder how this conversation might change if we introduce another framework into it, which is the question of labor, and not just the labor that students have to do and the labor that they face outside of the classroom, but faculty labor in the context of, I mean, let's, let's face it, in the, in the context of institutional collapse, the collapse of the liberal arts, the collapse of the humanities, um, at almost every level in the American university. Um, I was, uh, I, I actually, I'm a historian by training, I actually just interviewed for a job um, at a department, I won't name the department, and I asked the department chair, uh, what do you want out of this position? And she, and she said, well, the campus administration is basically at war with the humanities as a discipline and is looking to cut us at every single table. So we want to get somebody to you know drive enrollments up. Um, and this is a story that we've seen 
across the board, just in the past year alone, at the West Virginia University, we were just discussing that earlier, um, at, at other institutions. It's obviously not just, you know, humanities subjects either, which are on the chopping block. The mathematics has been cut, I believe, at uh, UNC Greensboro. And, um, you know, to say nothing of, what is it now, 75% of faculty in the United States are now non-tenure track um, which, which is really, I, I take to be the subtext of, of, of all of these conversations about the humanities. But I just, if we, if we tackle that head on as we're trying to give students a toolkit to understand the world and their place in it, but also while that toolkit is facing constant, constant retrenchment, constant attack, um, I, I don't know, I just, I, I wanted to put that on the table here. Yeah, I mean, I'll just uh, restate the question another way. Just another way of saying it is: uh, Is your concern that that with this kind of shrinkage, that you know, the doom narrative we've all heard, with uh, you know, and then twenty twenty six is going to be a demographic cliff? Um, you know, um, I could say some things about the CUNY system, about all of that stuff. Um, you know, that all the pressures, the economic pressures they're undergoing, and lines that have been put on hold. Um, but is there is the concern that fewer humanities faculty year equals fewer discussions, and that therefore fewer meditations on these to on these broad humanistic topics, including you know everything we've been talking about today, how to act ethically, how to inhabit a certain space, those questions are going to be gone. Those answer those discussions are going to be gone. Is that the issue? If that if that is the issue, then I I, I agree. Maybe that's a, maybe that's one way to you know go forward. Well, I, 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 I think I, what I guess I was kind of getting at is, is that on a practical level for those of us who are teaching in higher ed, um, who are struggling with these issues in the context of sort of a constant fight for uh, our own survival as, uh, as academics, as practitioners, who are also heavily invested in uh, having, those con uh, having those conversations be available for our students at whatever institution we find ourselves in, even while every signal that the institution is putting out is that those conversations are not actually worth having. How do we navigate that? That might be a, a better, more concise way for me to frame the question. Stephanie, I think you want to come in here? Yeah, um, so I'm in, in the College of Global Futures, and that's associated with the, um, the Global Futures Laboratory. And the Global Futures Laboratory was established a couple of years ago to be forward-looking on all fronts, and humanities you know, are, are part of that. And actually, um, when it was really originally formulated, you know, there were all these different um, topics that we were planning to address, and then after some discussions, what came out as the core of all of them was societal will. And so societal will is really rooted in the humanities. And um, so I was just at a workshop um, two days ago where it was all focused on, on what is the, you know, how, what is the role of the humanities and, you know, connections with science, uh, natural sciences, social sciences, and how in the global futures context can we do a better job um, basically, and um, one of the things that came up and is that, and I know the person who asked the question just before that I answered is not going to like this, but is that we need kind of an applied humanities, because most of my experience with humanities um, professors is critiques. <laughs> oh, you know, you forgot this, or you didn't consider this, or whatever, and what we need is Yes, and then what? How can we do things better? You know, what, what are some models of things that have happened in the past that we can learn from? And so I uh, know it's a little bit provocative, but this was where the conversation led was, you know, what is, um, what's kind of a constructive approach? Um, and I think within the context of the liberal arts discussion, this is a really important one. Stephanie, thank you for saying that. I would also add that all the panelists involved are, in, we are in various ways doing things that are thinking about uh, liberal education, about the humanities uh, differently. 
Um, so that is, you know, I think all of us would agree that higher education is in dire need of reform. Um, but I think it's, there's a, a, a way you can approach it, um, as you say, Stephanie, constructively. Yeah, and just to, to follow up, so this was in the context, it was environmental humanities hosted this event. And so they were all saying, yeah, you know, we, we understand this need, right? But a lot of our colleagues don't. And so, yeah, thank you for saying that. Thank you to all of you for a wonderful, thoughtful um, discussion. Um, I was just curious that the climate catastrophe is a global catastrophe. And to me, it seems like, and it's also very clear from the models and the modeling, that the global south is going to bear the brunt of the crises that are going to be rolling out. So I wonder what sense of responsibility we have being in the global north to really incorporate um, studies of the global south in order to humanize the global south, because that is part of you know, the historical problem of um, colonial hangover and histories of exploit exploitation and so on. So um, I wonder where where those conversations are happening. Uh, is there more curriculum that uh, is being sort of reformed? Are there, is there are, are new histories being read of other parts of the world? Um, what's, what do you all think we should be doing? How do, because you know, we are not going to be thinking ourselves out of this problem or solutions just as one nation. I mean, this has to be a global effort. And it's a global social will. It's not just the social will of universities in America, the children we are, you know, the kids that we are training, right? So I'm just curious. I very much appreciate your question. Um, being from a part of the world that is also often considered on the front lines of climate crisis, um, it has been very slow moving getting uh, people from those parts of the world into teaching positions, uh, getting students from those parts of the world in here, um, and foregrounding right some of those voices that we can understand as expertise. Um, so I think that's really important and, and urgent. Um, also, as somebody that teaches in Native and Indigenous studies, but is an Indigenous person from a different part of the world, uh, I spend a lot of time really carefully thinking about how to build my relations here, uh, such that right there also, like by, by only thinking about the Global South as the site of crisis, um, I think we also have to think really carefully about the communities here that are living in these crises. Um, so there's, you know, in the Northeast particularly, there's a lot of erasure of indigenous communities such that um, it is a hard push to get students to think those registers together. Um, and for me, that feels just absolutely necessary. Um, I would say similarly that um, I think what we've been doing in relation to conversation with the loose collective around black ecologies is uh, is is positioning um, the sort of epistemological, but also the kind of spatial and other kinds of um, starting points that allow for translation across very various differences. First of all, similarly recognizing the ways that at least, particularly in the U.S. South. Um, the, the catastrophic shows up in very similar ways that it does in um, in the in the global south and and seeing that as a point of connection and, and translation um, and I think from within black studies really thinking about blackness as an object um, of inquiry and blackening as as a as a mode not of just very readily placing the the constraints um, of, around what that identity has meant in, in the Americas in particular or in the Atlantic in particular onto everybody. But did, again, seeing it as a rich point of translation and possibility. So for example, when we did a global, we did a special issue on um, global black ecologies 
And in addition to trying to cover various parts of the diaspora, we also um, invited um, Dalit scholars to be a part of that conversation, not as a simple caste and race that's deeply problematic. We could have that whole conversation, but um, not to conflate those things, but to say from this point of radical disposability, of wretchedness, of who is considered expendable, where do we start to have conversation and see the rich um, traditions and, and, and capaciousness of very differently oriented, very differently oppressed communities in dialogue. And so I think um, the zine is another way that we try to have, we, we led the zine with an interview with um, an organization that's based in, um, in one of the, um, the townships outside of South Africa. Um, and they were our lead because they put it straight up, food should be free, right? Like, and, and so um, just as one thread within that conversation around food justice, they, were, they, had the, they had the clearest point of view about that. And so I think really, um, really shaking up and, and reimagining how we, we understand where solutions and, and alternative visions that are viable come from um, that have not... Um, that are not often considered even a part of liberal arts education that are, are radically excluded um, from those because of, of a distance from formal academic space or whatever else. So, yes, I think and I think, you know, Fanon's Wretched or Damned um, is such a is such a um, a vital moving thing for me. Like, how do we, how, what would a world that is remade in the image of the wretched look like? And I think that's, um, that's an imperative. And I think also what we can do is help to build up an intellectual and practical arsenal against extractive global capitalism. Like part of what we might do is, is build the, build an arsenal that can take down some of the, um, you know, I'm thinking about Huey Newton's 1970, um, you know, and we could talk about in a more complex way about Huey Newton, but um, his 1970, I believe it was, um, sort of theorization of revolutionary intercommunalism, um, which he took to me, which I think people took as just his theorization to match the survival programs of the Black Panther Party as a turn away from their more radical confrontational politics. But in that, first of all, he's a, a radical theorist of globalization right at the moment in the ways that he is understanding technocracy and, and cybernetics as part of that. But also he's just he says in that the revolutionary vision of inner um, of intercommunalism might look like these various local um, communities using the technologies and techniques of, of global capital to strategically reorient how they relate to each other outside of extraction and disposability. So I think, again, yeah, part of what we could do in this context that would be in service of the so-called global south is to help build an arsenal that, that interrupts in serious ways the, the accumulating, accumulation and disaccumulation. I had a much softer uh, intervention in mind, which is just yeah. reading the environmental histories of other yeah. parts of the world, even, right? Yeah. Uh, histories, environmental histories, um, as part of curricula um, and expanding the curricular footprint. Well, can I say... I totally, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I was just going to pick up on that comment, if I could, for a moment. I think the softness um, does point to um, another one of these constitutive tensions that we need to navigate and thinking about the liberal arts. Um, to be sure, there's a danger of parochialism in, in human nature. And so when we talk about localism, for example, I think we have to also be aware of that danger of parochialism. Um, the truth is I get nervous when I hear uh, liberal education described as a way to build public opinion for any particular view. Um, instead, I think of it as a way of informing judgment and hoping then that the judgments people will make as products of liberal education will be good ones. But as soon as students catch a whiff of a, an answer they're meant to adopt, I think we, we, we suffocate part of liberal education, which is supposed to be critical thinking and judgment and evidence gathering and argument and weighing different alternatives. So in spite of the urgency of the climate crisis and in spite of the inequities 
um, in politics, I think um, it's, a, it's a delicate balance that, that liberal education has to find in um, putting forward certain vantage points, making sure we don't we aren't over, overly parochial, and the ones that we know about, which most institutions have been for too long, um, and yet leaving room for, for, for our students to develop and make judgments. Great, thank you. Um, I'm mindful of the time, so maybe one last question, and in our responses, let's try to keep them concise. And then if there are remaining questions, please come and talk to us after. Um, thank you very much. This is very interesting. I'm personally an undergraduate, uh, so hearing you talk about the students is personally very meaningful. Um, and as I'm going for a Bachelor of Science, but I have taken advantage of the liberal arts education, and I have found it very difficult for me personally to bring in even just the question of objectivity that science often presumes into my science courses. Um, and similarly, to incorporate uh, science studies history into what the solutions that my science courses are. And so I'm wondering what you think are the potential, the potential institutional barriers that might enforce these limitations for students to incorporate these disciplines, even if they are at a liberal arts institution overall, or if um, institutes like at Rutgers at Arizona State are beginning to cross that boundary, allow students to make these spaces, and even just for the role of, for example, a scientist activist, which I would personally be very interested in, but feel like there's no space for me to do so. so. Hmm. I could maybe jump in on that one. So I, in my, um, my career, so I, I worked, um, you know, I did my undergrad at a liberal arts um, school, Colgate University, and then I, um, I worked for a US, the US Geological Survey, so I worked for a government agency, then I got my PhD at MIT, then I, um, I went to the US House of Representatives and I was a science staffer uh, for the science committee and, um, and went to uh, Germany and to do a postdoc and then also worked for the Environmental Defense Fund. So I've had this kind of, I've been in and out of different types of, you know, political, you know, agency, based, like mission driven and then um, environmental advocacy um, organizations. And I, and then I've, in my own work, I moved to, more towards, you know, activism, you know, informing decision making, but then also, uh, you know, promoting, you know, solutions, which is, you know, activism, I guess. And it's been difficult, right? So, you know, your objectivity gets, gets challenged um, and, you, um, and you need to be careful about, you know, how you, how you engage. Um, but on the other hand, you know, it's just, it's too important not to. And as I mentioned before, you know, it, when you expect people who work in the medical fields to advocate for for better health, you know, right? And and they have ways, you know, to do it. And so it's um, I think the the world is changing. And actually, you know, part of um, ASU's um, charter, which is literally carved in stone, is that we do use inspired research and that we have responsibility for the communities um, that we that we serve and engage with. So I think that there are places that are, are, are trying, um, but I appreciate very much that both your will to kind of cross these, these bridges, and then also I, I'm hoping that things will be opening up more for you as um, in the future, because uh, people are seeing that you, know, you, can, you can shop from the ivory tower, right? but, but you know, it's really important that we actually um, lend our expertise to, to these big issues like climate change that where we need to have all hands on deck. Maybe that's a great note to end on. I think it's a wonderful question, last question. Um, so Debbie, I know you want to say a, a few last words. I just want to say this is such an exciting and important conversation, and it must be continued. We must find opportunities to continue it. In a moment, I will invite you to continue it over 
the reception. Um, I hope you will be able to stay to join us, but first, please join me in thanking our moderators and speakers.